I'm here with Professor Vladimir Hachinsky from uh, Western University in Ontario. He's a professor of clinical neurosciences and he looks specifically at stroke and the effect of stroke on the brain and instance of dementia. So one of the things you told me is that if you lower the rate of stroke, you can lower the rate of dementia. Can you talk right. a little bit more about that? Yes. In the year 2000, the province of Ontario invested in doing something more about stroke. So they built stroke units, uh, they built uh, stroke prevention clinics, and they had campaigns to control risk factors. And so we took a look to see what has happened over the past 12 years. And we have shown that for the past 12 years, the incidence of stroke has decreased steadily, a total of about 35%. And then, for the, and then over the same period, the incidence of dementia has decreased by 17%. Now, in terms of 17% in the province of 14 million, we're talking a lot of people who have been prevented from having a stroke by preventing stroke. But, excuse me, dementia by preventing stroke. And we know now that a, um, a stroke will double or triple the chances of developing dementia. So something we're going to do right now is to prevent stroke and so that's good in itself, yeah. but as a bonus, we cannot prevent some dimensions. Okay. And what have you seen happening in the brain when someone has a stroke or after they've had a stroke? Uh, well, the first thing happened with stroke, well, the, the, the commonest type of stroke is when a, a, a blood vessel is closed and that part of the brain dies. But that set up tremendous inflammation. And elderly people often have amyloid. Amyloid is one of the things that can be associated with Alzheimer's disease. So the amyloid is like a fuel, and uh, a stroke, whether large or small, can be a trigger. And that makes it much more likely they'll, they'll develop dementia. So if you prevent the stroke in the first instance, you may have the, the fuel, but you don't have the fire. Okay. And so you said um, in Western Ontario, they've done, or Ontario, they've done a number of things to decrease the incidence Correct. of stroke. What yeah. have been the principal things that have made a difference? Uh, well, I think stroke units because that has better outcomes. And so people, uh, one of the most important things that determines whether a person goes home or goes to a chronic facility is what their mental state is and how well they recover from the stroke. And stroke units are now with TPA and thrombectomy, which is when they remove the clot. This has improved the, uh, the outcome of these patients, so they're more likely to remain at home uh, and, and not go to a chronic facility. Then the other thing that's happened is stroke prevention clinics. We show that if you have a warning of a stroke and you go to a stroke clinic, then your chance of dying that year decreases by 26%. And the reason probably is you get diagnosed quickly, you get treated appropriately, and that prevents a stroke from happening. And then the third thing is the risk factor control. Uh, we're looking at that because there are five provinces in Canada who have a stroke strategy and five that do not. And we expect to see that the ones that have a stroke strategy also have a decrease in the incidence of dementia as well as stroke. Okay. And what are they recommending that people do in terms of um, dealing with the risk factors? What are the things that they've uh, recommended? Well, well, the first thing is that, um, well, I think it really helps to have uh, someone to do it with you. They have shown, for example, that uh, if you decide in the new year to exercise, only about 16% of people are still exercising in, in, at the end of the year. Whereas if you have a companion, a friend who does it with you, 61% are doing it. So the advice is you know what to do. You have to exercise, you have to eat properly, and uh, you also have to watch your risk factors, like high blood pressure, which is very important. But you have a much better success if you have a, a buddy, a friend, a partner. So that's so exercise is one thing, diet is another. Correct. Um, controlling are, risk factors. So if you have okay. high cholesterol, yep. that has to be treated medically. If you have blood pressure, you may require drugs. Yeah. And if you have irregularity of the heart, it's called AFib, which becomes more and more common with increasing age. That puts you at danger not only of stroke but also of dementia. And you tell me that you've seen specific interaction um, of amyloid and right. the vascular yeah. system in mice. Can you say a bit about uh, what you've actually seen? Well, in rats, seen? actually. Sorry, uh, rats. Yeah, uh, I have a colleague called Sean Whitehead, and uh, we're working with what we call the transgenic mice that has two of the genes that express amyloid. And we find that these animals develop tremendous inflammation in the white matter. But we can make this worse by feeding them a, a, a diet rich in fats, salt, and sugar, 
or we can make them worse by making them hypertensive, having a high blood pressure. But the thing that really triggers it off is a small stroke. Even a small stroke will create tremendous inflammation and then scars in the brain that interfere with your ability to think and to act normally. Okay, and so I think there's a lot of research being done around inflammation and the role Correct. in Alzheimer's and dementia, right. but I think it seems that people aren't quite sure about the, the actual mechanisms, like how it's interacting with the tau, the amyloid, what's uh, happening exactly in the brain, but what's no. the latest theory? What's the well, I, best Well, first of all, it, it's not that simple because okay. you see inflammation is not good or bad. Yeah. If you have dead brain, and, uh, then you need inflammation to clear the dead tissue. The problem is that sometimes you jazz up the system and, it, and then it, it, it attacks healthy brain. Okay. So the question is, if you have had a stroke, for example, well, you want the inflammation to be there at the beginning, but at some point you want to suppress it. Yeah. And we're studying that. You know, what's the timing? Because we, you cannot simply give a drug and suppress inflammation. That may actually be harmful. Mm -hmm. Because some of the cells, microglia they're called, yeah. uh, they, they can either pick up the garbage, uh, but they can also release garbage, toxic toxins that damage the brain. And also, they are capable of helping the repair of the brain. The, more remar the most remarkable thing about the, about the stroke, for example, is not the damage that it causes, but the recovery it allows. Pretty well, every patient recovers to some extent. Okay. The brain reorganizes itself. And, you, and inflammation interrupts that process? Which does? Inflammation yeah. or stroke? Uh, well, as I said, it, 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 if there's chronic inflammation, then yeah. it does. Okay. Yeah. And so is there, in terms of looking for a drug, a lot of it has been focused on amyloid and tau. Yeah. Are there different um, things that you think that should be targeted that look more broadly uh, at yes what's I happening do. The, in the more brain? broadly thing is, well, first of all, there's something that we, we, we have not addressed, and that is the most powerful predictor of dementia is actually age. And, uh, uh, and as, you, as you probably know, people age at different rates. You know, you have some people the same age, and somebody looks young, and somebody looks old. Mm -hmm. And we need to develop measures of what the biological age is. And then, uh, when we do studies, we want to make sure that the people we're studying are of the same age biologically to give a chance to the drug to work. Because if we have somebody who's the same chronological age, but one is, the, the, the brain is 10 years older, it may not be powerful enough to overcome the aging brain, whereas it may work on the younger person. And we're not doing that. This is one of the areas that should be explored. They talk about biomarkers, but they're talking about tau and amyloid as usual, the usual suspects. But I think we should be looking at biomarkers of biological aging, and there are several. And, and going back to treatment, uh, it turns out that uh, we are known for a long time that restricting diet, certainly in animals, will prolong their life. Uh, and also, there is a drug called metformin, which is used in diabetes, which seems to prolong life. So now there's a trial to see whether taking that drug actually pushes aging back. So we should not be just concentrating on the one thing. We have to be concentrating on if we can delay aging, and that's probably better than preventing any one disease.